So what I'm going to be talking about today is, is design, like how can we design experiments in a way that's sort of maximally informative uh, and the best uh, way we can design them. And I'm just going to start off uh, with an example here to sort of try and uh, give you an idea of what I mean. So imagine uh, we're a psychologist and we're sort of trying to figure out people's sort of subjective value of money um, in the sort of presence of delays. So we might ask them questions along the lines of, would you like 60 pounds now? Uh, or would you prefer hundred pounds in a year? Um, and what we want to do is we want to make sure we ask good questions. So uh, we might instead think about asking, would you want 200 pounds in a year? Uh, today or £100 in a year and we want to sort of figure out how, how do we get good um, questions. So here obviously these questions aren't equally good. Um, if we ask people if they want £200 today or £100 a year that's not going to generally be very informative uh, because it doesn't really matter who we're asking, almost everyone is going to take uh, £200 now. You'd be kind of crazy to take a smaller amount of money uh, sometime in the future. Uh, and so say we've got a, a drug addict uh, and some sort of retired professor, they're both going to sort of want uh, money up front, money now. If though we sort of uh, ask them something like, would you like £60 today or £100 in a year? We might get different responses. So now uh, so, uh, someone that's sort of has a drug addiction problem is likely to sort of want, want fast money uh, and some other people might want to delay. And so we're sort of discriminating between our participants. We've got a more pertinent question uh, and therefore essentially a better um, design. And uh, where this gets particularly exciting is when we're not just sort of necessarily saying asking one question, uh, but when we're starting to ask a series of questions. So where it's really exciting is when we can start being adaptive. We can start using information that we're gaining from previous sort of iterations of our experiments to kind of um, update things and uh, learn as we go. So we might have sort of a, a cyclic sort of process um, where maybe we have some kind of model particularly might have some sort of Bayesian model. Uh, and as we get more data, we can update that Bayesian model. We can use that updated Bayesian model to choose new designs for the next iteration. We can run that iteration of the experiment and we can uh, sort of keep going with this process and it will sort of hopefully sort of be pertinent uh, and honed down. So as we learn, for example, in our participants in the psychology survey, we can make sure that we're asking questions that are sort of informative to that participant. We're gaining information about that particular participant and adapting to them. Uh, and we want to do this in a sort of automated way um, so that we can go and actually let this thing run. The problem is, is that um, the sort of way this is usually done in practice um, is very, very slow. So the, um, I'm going to be introducing something called Bayesian experimental design, and that generally requires a huge amount of computation to basically run um, during the experiment. So this process of kind of updating some sort of Bayesian model, using that model to choose a, a design, these are both very slow processes. Uh, and so this live experiment becomes very slow, and this makes this process sort of quite impractical. It's very rare we can do it because we can't wait four hours for our next question um, because we've got to sort of actually run this thing in real time. So the core of this talk is about showing how we can go and take this approach and adapt it and do it a different way that will actually allow us to run this in real time. We can have these adaptive model-based approaches to design, uh, but we can make them fast enough that we can actually um, go and use them. And I'm going to be sort of slowly building up to this, but just to give everyone an idea of kind of where I'm going, what we're going to be doing is basically a kind of amortization style process where before we actually do anything before the experiment starts, we're going to do a lot of sort of offline training uh, where we're going to take the model um, that we're using for that, that experimental design process uh, and we're going to learn a kind of a policy from that model. And that policy is basically going to allow us to run things quickly. So uh, that policy will take in sort of the, the past set of experiment iterations, so the past sort of designs we chose and the outcomes we got, and it will return um, designs automatically for us. So if we learn this thing up front and this policy-based thing, we can go and deploy that policy at the time of the experiment. We can go and run that very quickly. And that is going to massively increase sort of the range um, of things that we're going to go and do. What we're going to find as well is that lots of interesting things happen uh, along the way. Um, in particular, we're going to find that this kind of amortization approach actually improves the performance in the sense of the designs as well. Even though we're sort of doing this purely originally from a speed point of view, it's also interesting going to turn out to be a better way of getting the designs uh, in the end as well. Uh, and I'll sort of slowly build up and explain uh, why that's going to be the case. But it's going to be the sentence of sort of amortizing this process, but unlike, say, amortized inference, the amortization here is actually going to help our performance as well.
Okay, so that's this general high level idea. We want to do these adaptive experiments uh, and we want to do them quickly, uh, but let's sort of take a step back uh, and just be a bit more careful and go through what I'm, I'm really talking about. So uh, this whole talk is based around the idea of a Bayesian experimental design. Uh, and that's a, a framework for how we can sort of design experiments in an optimal manner. And we're going to sort of assume we've got access to three, this sort of three things. So we've got some design, that's the thing we're controlling, that's the thing we're going to be trying to optimize for eventually. Um, we have something we want to learn about, we call that theta. These are sort of latent variables, there's some factors of interest. So in that sort of uh, psychology experiment, it's kind of the underlying factors um, that dictate how people would sort of respond to those questions. And the third sort of variable we're going to have are outcomes. So when we run a design, um, so we run an experiment with a particular design, uh, we have this unknown latent variable, and there's going to be some outcome that comes from this. So these three things are naturally linked by a sort of a Bayesian model. We have some prior information about what we're trying to learn about. We have some likelihood that dictates the kind of outcomes we'll see given the thing we're trying to learn about and the designs we choose. And of course, we've got a posterior um, that is proportional um, to this prior times this likelihood in the standard Bayesian way. What our goal now is, is that we want to choose these designs and so we gather the most information as we can. So we want to choose a design so that our outcomes are as informative as possible about these latents that we're trying to learn about. So we want these chi that give us the wide and most informative about the theta, because then we'll get the best information from our experiment. So, so if we return uh, to that example, we might be able to sort of parameterize this as the, sort of the question, as might be the uh, amount of money we're going to offer today might be chi. Uh, we're going to compare that to 100 pounds in a year. And then depending on different questions and different answers, we'll end up with kind of different posteriors out. We've got different information uh, we're getting from things. So in particular, if we ask this sort of poor quality question, would you like 200 pounds today, 100 pounds in a year? that's going to lead to very little difference between our prior and our posterior, very little information has been gained um, from the experiment. Um, but if uh, we ask a more informative question, uh, we sort of reduce the entropy of our posterior more, and we've got this more informative experiment. So we can formalize this, and we can formalize this with something uh, called uh, the information gain. Um, so this is the gain in Shannon information about the parameters we're trying to learn about. So by having this model, that model gives us a formalized notion of information, and that notion of information is through this entropy. And we can just simply look at, well, what was the entropy of what we cared about before the experiment minus the entropy after the experiment, and that is the gain uh, in information we get by running this. And then this is naturally a, a function um, of this design that we're going to choose. Uh, but unfortunately, it's also a function of the outcome, which we don't know either. So to deal with this, we don't just look at the information gain, we actually look at the expected information gain, or the EIG, and this is the expectation over possible outcomes of that experiment of the information we will gain. So for any particular design, we can kind of simulate what possible outcomes we might get of the experiment, and then for any particular outcome coupled with that design, we'll have an information gain, and we can look at the expectation um, of that information gain. So Again, we can use our model, this sort of PY given chi is defined by the model, it's a marginal over theta, so we can sample that by sampling um, a theta, sampling a Y given the theta to sample from our marginal, and so we can use our model basically to simulate outcomes, and with those simulated outcomes, we can look at how much information that outcome would give us and choose the best thing um, in expectation, and this gives us this metric for deciding how good an experiment is. It's um, a term that comes up quite a lot. Um, it's also actually the mutual information um, between the parameters and the outcomes. Uh, it's also known as uh, the Bayesian active learning by disagreement or the bold score in active learning. So it's something that actually crops up a lot more uh, than people realize. Um, and uh, it, it's a sort of a fundamental sort of construct in this idea of information. It's, it's a bit in some ways like Bayes' rule that we've always got this universal way of saying how uh, much information are we going to gain from our experiment. As I said before, where this can get particularly interesting though is, is when we start thinking about not just sort of designing a single experiment, uh, but when we have a sort of a series of experiments. So uh, going back to that, that example, we might ask a series of questions um, rather than just one question, we want to sort of look at the expected information gain at any iteration um, of our experiment. So uh, Bayes gives us this nice thing that our prior can become the posterior from one iteration to the next. 
And so what we can do is we can look at the expected information gain at a particular step uh, by looking at the difference in the posterior entropy before and after um, we've run that experiment. So now we've got this expectation over outcome YT, the outcome of that T iteration, given that T for design of that posterior, given all the observations up to T minus one uh, versus the posterior with all observations up to uh, iteration T. And so this gives us a way of sort of repeatedly um, looking at this information uh, criterion uh, and be able to use it for these sort of multiple step experiments. So the traditional way um, that this is done uh, is, is sort of the somewhat obvious way of doing it, which is that basically we just cycle through um, the steps of running the experiment and updating uh, our Bayesian model. So each time we want to choose a design, we can fit our posterior, given all the observations we've seen so far. Then we can optimize this expected information gain um, for this next design. And we can look at this sort of one step um, sort of gain each time. And each time we run things, we'll get this new observation. We can just keep cycling. We have this sort of set of data. Each time we do an experiment, we increase our set of data. Uh, and we can keep calculating posteriors and keep optimizing uh, expected information gains for our updated posteriors. Unfortunately, though, um, these are both quite difficult problems. Bayesian inference, as we all know, it's not an easy problem to do. Uh, and this optimization of the EIG is also quite a difficult problem. In fact, um, this optimization of the EIG is going to be even more difficult um, than this, this inference problem most of the time. And so we get this big computational um, problem. And what's really problematic is that we have to do this computation each time. It's not that something we've done once, each time we have an experiment iteration, we've got this new posterior fitting we've got to do, we've got this new optimization we've got to do. And so it becomes a very expensive process when we're trying to do this uh, adaptively. So if we sort of um, go back a few years, um, it was definitely the sort of this uh, accepted idea that like these adaptive Bayesian experimental design approaches were very interesting, conceptually nice things, uh, but generally just too computation intensive to actually uh, be used in practice, unless we've got something that it's okay to have very, very long delays between experiments or very sort of simple models that we can still do these computations um, quickly enough for. And there are also a lot of issues in terms of things like scaling with dimensionality. Um, it often uh, could only be done in a sort of a few dimensions. Uh, and again, we've got this issue of speed. These things are just generally too slow. So um, what we're going to now look at is sort of why, where are these problems coming from and, and kind of how can we address them and how can we move towards this sort of notion uh, of running things in real time uh, so that we can actually use it practically. So the first thing I think we have to really consider um, is this expected information gain and, and sort of why is it so challenging um, to optimize it. And the thing we have to appreciate here is it, it's not actually just sort of an expectation. It's actually what's known as a nested expectation uh, or a doubly intractable quantity. So what we actually have is, is, is the expectation of these difference in entropies. Um, but if we look at the second entropy, this is the entropy of our posterior, that itself is, is an intractable quantity. So we've got this expectation of um, an intractable quantity. Uh, and so that becomes very difficult um, to work with. We can't even just do sort of Monte Carlo estimation to estimate this, let alone sort of go uh, and immediately optimize it. So to dig a bit further into this, um, we can rearrange uh, this expected information gain using Bayes rule. So we can sort of say that it's the expectation over the joint over parameters and observations given designs of the log of the ratio of the likelihood over the marginal likelihood. So this um, follows from this just by sort of writing out um, these entropies and then forming Bayes rules uh, with the combination of them just to sort of flip them around. And if we now look at this, um, we can sort of start thinking about, okay, how would we estimate it? We might start looking at doing Monte Carlo. We could draw some samples um, from this outer expectation. But what we see is that each sample uh, in this Monte Carlo estimate is, is itself intractable. We've got this log of this ratio, and we've got this marginal likelihood term uh, in each of these, which is an intractable thing. So we can't just do this, this simple Monte Carlo. What's worse, um, is it's just not it's not just a single intractable quantity. It's an intractable quantity that is different for each different possible observation. So if you've got lots of different possible uh, observations, in fact, it may even be continuous, uh, we've got to solve all of these separate intractable um, problems. 
And so we get something that's uh, sort of a, often like a nested Monte Carlo estimator if we estimate it with Monte Carlo, or more generally, these sort of nested estimation processes. And these are very computation intensive and very difficult to do. Uh, and they're well, really impractical to be doing during uh, an experiment itself. Obviously, it gets even worse when we think about the fact that we're not just estimating this. This is our objective function that we're kind of optimizing um, to go and try and solve uh, what design we should get next. So it's only really a stepping stone to our sort of design selection problem. Uh, and we see very quickly that this optimization, this choosing of designs uh, is an extremely difficult um, problem. And this has been largely why I think uh, Bayesian experimental design has not become uh, yeah, a sort of a particularly major uh, field because of this expense uh, and this difficulty of doing it. So um, in a, some work we did uh, over the last couple of years, we, we made some big uh, improvements, we think, in the ability to sort of actually um, both estimate and optimize um, these expected information gains. Uh, and the trick was, was basically comes around um, what happens if, if you look at starting to do variational um, style approaches here. So if it turns out basically that if you do variational inference um, approaches, you can actually get around um, this double interactability. It, it turns out basically things start to collapse uh, and you start to be able to actually formulate things uh, in a much easier way. And so in particular, um, what it turns out is that there are variational bounds, um, in particular variational lower bounds, um, on uh, the mutual information, on the expected information gain, uh, that can um, be estimated more directly using Monte Carlo methods, and therefore um, we can use stochastic gradient methods um, to go and optimize them. So uh, because we've got these lower bounds, we can estimate them unbiasedly, we can do a stochastic gradient descent approach that will sort of simultaneously do our um, optimization for us and at the same time um, do um, the estimation at the same time. So it's it's a bit like training, say, a variational autoencoder where we're kind of training both aspects at the same time. These things can go in unison and they can actually be much more effective um, by doing so. Uh, so to give a, a quick idea of, of what some of these things look like, um, one thing you might do is you might take the posterior and you might replace that posterior with the kind of inference network uh, as per sort of an encoder. Uh, in, a, in a variational encoder, and that amortized inference network can try and approximate the posterior uh, for any sort of combination of design um, and um, outcome. And if we can learn this inference network and give it some parameters phi, um, we can form one of these sort of variational bounds uh, where basically optimizing respect to these variational parameters gets our bound tighter and tighter towards uh, the true mutual information. Well, if we simultaneously optimize um, for those designs, we're making uh, the designs better. So what this comes out like is, is a kind of very standard variational or EM style viewpoint where each time we make an update, we're improving uh, the variational parameters and improving that variational parameters is pulling our bound up, making it tighter. And at the same time, we're moving up the slope in the design space. So we're getting more and more towards this sort of optimal point um, that we're trying to do. So uh, it turns out this, this stuff works extremely well. Um, it has another hidden advantage. It suddenly actually makes things much more scalable as well. These variational approaches uh, are well known to sort of work very well in high dimensions. And so one thing we managed to get from this was suddenly be able to do uh, these experimental design approaches in sort of hundreds or even thousands of dimensions, um, whereas people currently uh, before doing them in sort of maybe a, a couple of handfuls. And they're substantially quicker as well than the sort of uh, Monte Carlo based approaches uh, that people um, were typically using before. And so uh, at this point, we've, we've made quite a big progress. We, we've touched something that was very difficult to work with and we've made it much easier to work with. Um, but unfortunately, we're, we're still very much not there um, because again, we're, we're really needing these things to sort of run really quite quickly. If, if we're wanting to do things with human participants, those human participants are probably only going to want to wait a few seconds for any computation you want to do. Uh, you may even have something that's in more like a control setting and things might need to be even faster. And so it's just not viable um, to go and even do this kind of stochastic gradient descent. So um, even if it can be quite quick and effective, it's still probably going to take a few minutes, maybe an hour or something. And that's just still not something uh, that's viable, even if it's uh, a lot quicker uh, than it was before. So I'm so sorry, can I, can I ask okay. a question quickly? Yeah, of course. Um, you, you showed a, a, a lower bound and an upper bound on those results. 
Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I didn't quite see exactly how you, how you got both of them. Um, uh, sure, I, I didn't explain. <laughs> um, so um, so the, the problem is, is um, because it's a nested quantity, you can never actually make an unbiased estimate. There's no, uh, unless you get into things like Russian roulette sampling, there's no sort of mm. objective unbiased way of estimating it. Um, so we have to actually basically evaluate it by constructing two bounds. So the, the lower bound was actually the variational bound it was mm -hmm. being trained with, um, with a little bit of changing to make it a little bit more accurate. Um, the upper bound comes from the fact that there are also um, other bounds you can do um, that are upper bounds on mutual information. Okay. Um, and uh, they're, they're based around nested Monte Carlo methods that are basically you can show that they're always positively biased. Uh, and they give you these, these uh, upper bounds. So basically it, it's estimated by looking at two different bounds and we know that the real values between them, because um, we can we can estimate each bound quite accurately. We just can't get the bounds that tight. Um, so so is, the, is the upper bound done from some nested Monte Carlo or is it an analytical yes. thing? Okay, right. Oh yeah, it, yeah it's exactly it's from, so the, the expectation of the nested Monte Carlo estimate is actually an upper bound in this right. particular problem. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, cool. Um, yeah. So, um, so just going back, um, we we were saying that this thing is is still problematically expensive, even though we, we sort of substantially um, sped it up. And if we want to sort of make that quicker, we need to actually go back and look at this original sort of pipeline that we were working with. This idea that each time um, we do things, we're going to kind of refit our posterior. Um, redo that optimization, that's just not going to be viable. So even just fitting the posterior each iteration is not going to be a, a viable thing to do for quite a lot of problems. And we need to kind of break um, the cycle. We need to stop uh, requiring ourselves to, to do this inference and optimization uh, each iteration uh, if we want uh, to go and run uh, this adaptive uh, design process in real time. So how might we go about doing that? How might we actually have something that runs fast enough that we can actually use it? Um, so we can also, of course, do uh, heuristics. I think this is sort of a lot of the thing that is done in practice and not the times people do um, heuristics that are designed to particular problems. Uh, and we can do things like sort of decision trees uh, in a survey that we can use that can be very quickly deployed. Um, but th these are obviously going to be quite limited. Uh, they're not very principled and they're something you're going to have to very much do uh, on a case by case basis. So what we want is something that is fast. Um, like a heuristic approach, uh, but we want to uh, maintain the sort of good designs we're getting from this Bayesian experiment design. In particular, um, the sort of optimality results about Bayesian experiment design, and we want to stick with those uh, results. We want designs that are still very effective, uh, that are sort of maximally uh, informative. And so the big idea uh, behind the, the sort of first paper we had this is to say, well, what we actually need to do is not learn the designs what we need to do is learn a policy. We need to learn some policy that will decide uh, what designs to use automatically. So what I mean by that is given some sort of history, so given a set of sort of um, designs I've tried and the outcomes I got from those uh, designs, I want to learn some function that basically maps that history directly to a design. So kind of like you learn policies in reinforcement learning, again, we want to learn something that learns to make the designs rather than optimizing for the designs um, themselves. So if we can learn this policy, we can go back and when we actually run the experiment, we just need to apply this policy to do the design. If that policy is already there, we can take in the data we've already got, this history HT minus one, we can pass that through our policy, that will give us the next design to try, uh, this chi t, that gives us the new pairing. We can go and run that new experiment. We get the new updated um, history, the new updated set of data. And again, if we've got our policy set up in the right way, uh, we can go and use that again. So what we want to do is do this sort of computation up front and learn this policy so that we can deploy um, this policy when it comes to the actual experiment. So uh, the paper is, is called Deep Adapted Design or, or DAD. Um, and what it's based around is, is both, firstly, obviously, this idea of using a policy, uh, but then also to say, well, let's leverage uh, deep learning approaches to try and actually set that policy up itself. So what we're going to do is basically going to construct, and I'll show you how to do that shortly, an objective that's a function of the policy rather than a function of the designs. 
And then what we can do is we can train uh, that network using uh, sort of standard deep learning frameworks. If we can do things in gradient based methods, set the objective up, we can learn the parameters of that network. Uh, and we can basically train uh, the parameters of that network to what will turn out to be a variational bound on um, the mutual information. We can learn uh, this design network up front. So what this will give us is this sort of policy-based Bayesian experimental design, where before we see anything about the experiment, we're going to set up um, some training problem. We're going to have our model, have a prior, and we're going to train this design policy by basically simulating from our own model. We're going to simulate possible sort of outcomes uh, and simulate the trajectories or rollouts um, of the experimental process. We'll use those simulated um, sort of rollouts to learn this policy. And then when it comes to the experiment, we're just going to apply that policy and it's going to allow us um, to run things quickly. Um, I'll come back to this a bit later, but one interesting thing is this is also actually going to potentially give us some uh, advantages in terms of the policies themselves. So uh, the sort of traditional approach is going to turn out to be a sort of a greedy myopic policy. It's actually going to be an implicit uh, policy if we do this sort of calculating of the posterior, then optimizing the EHG at time. That is actually going to implicitly define a particular and not optimal policy. Uh, but what we'll actually find is that this, this DAD approach actually allows us to learn policies that are even better um, than the traditional approach. Uh, because that traditional approach actually is itself suboptimal. Anyway, taking a step back, um, we should obviously be asking their question here about how um, should we actually be training that policy network? How can we actually learn this thing to go and make uh, the decisions? Uh, well, to answer that, we have to think, okay, what do we want uh, the policy to do? Well, the policy is going to make our decisions. It's going to choose designs uh, based on the history. And a good policy is going to be one that over the course of the whole experiment um, maximizes what we can call the total expected information gain. So we have a series of experiment iterations. Each iteration gives us some um, information gain. And what we can do is we can look at the sort of the sum of these information gains and maximize the expected uh, sum of these uh, individual uh, expected information gains. So in the teeth iteration, We've got the expected um, information gain was this mutual information or this um, expected reduction uh, in entropy uh, from uh, adding one of our observations. So uh, our prior kind of here is P theta given the history HT minus one. We can simulate um, new possible outcomes given the design. We'll get um, our updated posterior. We can calculate this expected information gain of that teeth iteration. And we want to look at the sum of all these informations we're gaining over the course of the experiment and maximize uh, that total sum. And it's still an expectation uh, because we've got things like um, the theta and things on the outside uh, of this as well. Um, and what it turns out is that rather than kind of having to sort of worry about one iteration after another and how much information we gain at one iteration, the next iteration, the next iteration, we can actually kind of just look at it as a start to end. Um, so um, one of the theorems we, we prove in the paper is to basically show that the sort of cumulative information you gain uh, is exactly equal to the information gained from going to, from the start to the end. So this is sort of intuitively, hopefully relatively clear cut in that if we gain a series of data, it doesn't matter um, that we sort of gain them one by one, we're gaining the same amount of data and we gain the same information um, from that total. Uh, set of data. So what we can say is that this, this total information gain, um, it can actually be given by this term here, um, which is essentially the, the mutual information between our parameters and the full rollout of the history. So we can think about the sort of rollout as being a, a random variable because we have a series of random outcomes. We have outcome decision, outcome decision. If we have a deterministic policy, we've got this as, as essentially a, a random variable. Um, and we can look at this mutual information between what we're trying to learn about beta and HT, this history that's effectively the data um, that we've generated. And so if we look at this expected information gain in the data, uh, sorry, expected information gain in the uh, parameters or equivalent of the mutual information between the data and those parameters, um, it just gives us a sort of an end-to-end -end, um, objective that we can work with. And uh, this is something where we can actually start looking at something we, we might actually be able to estimate and work with. Um, so this, this total information gain, it's, it's an expectation 
um, under the, the prior of the theta and this sort of implied distribution over possible rollouts. So this is just something where basically we can sample a theta and then um, we given that theta, we can um, sample an outcome and we can keep sort of doing this. We can use our policy to choose designs. Given the design and the theta, we can sample the next outcome. Given those, we can use the policy again to choose the next design. And we can basically forward simulate um, an experimental process. And this expectation on the outside is an expectation over this simulated rollout of the full experiment process. In here, uh, we see that the sort of objective we've got is the, the log ratio uh, of the sort of the likelihood of all of that data given theta over the margin likelihood, just like it sort of was uh, in the standard setting. And again, this is something we can sort of start uh, to work with. So what we want to do is we want to, ideally we'd want to sort of train uh, policy parameters, uh, sort of network weights and biases uh, to maximize um, this sort of total expected information gain. Uh, but of course, we're going to hit this, this problem again. This thing is not tractable. This marginal um, probability of the data is uh, an intractable quantity. And again, we're going to have um, some issues. But we can do the same trick as before. We can introduce a sort of variational bound um, on uh, this total expected information gain. And we can instead look to optimize this um, variational bound, this lower bound on uh, the total information gain and use that as a proxy um, to go and learn our um, network parameters. So uh, one example uh, of the kind of uh, bound we can use is, is something called, uh, or that we call the, the sequential uh, prior contrastive uh, information, uh, sorry, pr sequential prior contrastive estimation um, bound. So uh, this, as I was saying, is, is a lower bound on the total information we will gain from an experiment. And it's based uh, around the idea of using contrastive samples. Um, so what it is, is it's, it's an expectation um, over what I'll now call P theta zero. This is the parameter we're trying to learn about. Um, it's simulating a rollout from this theta zero. Uh, but what we're also going to do is, is simulate a number of contrastive samples. So we sample one theta that we're actually going to use, and then we're going to sample L theta that we're not going to use. And basically by comparing uh, the theta we do use, the theta we don't use, uh, we can derive uh, this contrastive bound uh, that's used in sort of contrastive style deep learning approaches. And it's a sort of a, a known bound uh, in mutual information uh, land. And what it is, is this expectation of the log of the likelihood of the feature we did use over uh, a Monte Carlo estimate that's formed of uh, likelihood uh, terms for each of the Ls, including um, the one we used and the ones uh, we didn't. So it's a sum from L equals zero uh, to L. So we're, we're, the reason it becomes a lower bound is that we use the true theta as well as all these contrastive samples. Um, if we instead summed from L equals one to L, you would actually get a nested Monte Carlo estimate that's an upper bound. Uh, by, by including that extra term, you get this valued lower bound. And then this is something that we can actually work with. This is something we can sample from. We can sample those rollouts. We can sample contrastive samples. Each term here is evaluatable. These are these likelihood terms. And therefore, we can go and we can run stochastic gradient ascent. We can generate unbiased estimates. Um, we can generate unbiased estimates of the gradients. And therefore, we can do end-to-end -end training um, of our deep neural network, of our policy network. And we can learn this pi and um, phi to go and then use experiment time to actually run our experiment. Uh, so again, we're just going to use, as I said, these uh, stochastic gradient policies. Uh, but what's key and what's changed is that basically we're now optimizing the policy parameters instead of optimizing for the designs. So we've reframed it to not learn the designs directly, but learn this function that will tell us how to do designs. And we're going to do that by stochastic gradient descent of a variational bound on this total information gain. So uh, just to sort of really hopefully hand this home, we can just quickly go through sort of an algorithmic uh, approach of how this will be. Um, so our inputs is we, we need a prior over the things we care about, P theta. We need a likelihood model that can simulate outcomes um, given um, theta and our designs psi. And we're gonna have some number of experiment steps T. What we're trying to learn uh, is this design network, this policy network, uh, that we can use later. And what we're going to do is we're just going to sample um, these theta from P theta. 
uh, set the history to zero, uh, so it's to, to the empty set. We'll then cycle through our number of experiment iterations. We're going to first use our policy to choose the next design, given the history so far. Once we've got that new design, we sample a new outcome, yt, from our likelihood. And then we update this set of history to the pair of all um, the design outcomes we've had. And this thing can just um, loop around. Once we get to the end, um, we'll calculate the gradient uh, of this approach. So we'll implicitly be using some sort of automatic differentiation scheme to differentiate through this whole process, this rollout process. Uh, and so using modern things like PyTorch or TensorFlow, we can get these gradients automatically. And by using those gradients, uh, we can do stochastic gradient updates. This thing above was essentially giving us a Monte Carlo estimate, and therefore it's giving us a stochastic gradient update. And if we just keep running this, uh, we'll be able to train this um, pi uh, phi. And then once we've trained it, we just go and use it at test time. And that just means that uh, each time uh, we choose a design, we pass it in, we run our experiment in the real world, we get the new pairing, update our history, and we can just go and deploy this directly. So this is this deep adaptive design approach. We've got these key ingredients, we've got this policy network, we've got this end-to-end -end objective, this total information gain, and we've got these tractable um, lower bounds that we can use to go and train it. And what that means is if we go back and we try and apply this, once we've done some training up front, we go and do a bit of our work before the experiment. When we want to go and do our psychology trial or online survey or anything, um, we can just go and have this thing work automatically. So uh, someone might go and we might ask them first, do you want 90 pounds a day or 100 pounds in a year? Our policy tells us uh, to ask that question. Maybe we answer 100 pounds in a year. We just pass these answers back through the policy network. That usually takes one or two milliseconds. And then we're ready again to ask the next question and then making sure that question is pertinent. And we've learned to do this adaptive design in real time. If instead, say we would uh, said we wanted the 90 pounds today, our policy would have then chosen a different question for the second step. And we can see how this is learned to be adaptive um, to read, uh, the setting and therefore uh, do things automatically. Um, so this, this psychology trial example is, is actually not completely arbitrary. I've actually worked with uh, psychologists. They really do this experiment. Um, they have a model um, that sort of takes the form here. They actually run these. They even give people the actual money. Um, and they ask questions like, do you want R pounds today or 100 pounds in D days? Um, so that gives us this R and D as our parameters we want to optimize. Our outcomes are uh, sort of binary, which one did we choose? And they have um, quite simple models uh, based uh, on what they call uh, discount parameters or discount rates uh, to do it. And we can go and actually deploy this uh, and, and run these real experiments. And in short, it, it turns out that these approaches work uh, extremely well, um, both um, in terms of speed um, and interestingly, in, in terms of uh, performance as well. Um, so here, these first two columns are lower and upper bounds uh, on the information we actually gained. As I was explaining earlier, we, we can't estimate the actual information gain exactly, but we can very accurately do these lower and upper bounds. The truth, therefore, is between these two. Um, and uh, so we consider here sort of a heuristic approach that was uh, a sort of an old standard in the field that's heuristic specific to this application. Um, there's some work I did uh, four years ago uh, with a psychologist where we did this sort of traditional um, approach where we do inference each time, uh, then we optimize um, the myopic uh, expected information gain, uh, and that gives us somewhat more information than the heuristic. Um, but we find here that this, this deep adaptive design, this DAD approach, gives us even more information um, than that as well. And it does that in, in a, a tiny fraction of the time uh, to do it. So in some ways, this, this is a bit surprising. We, we, were, we were looking to make things quick. Our original objective is this thing has to be run in real time. We've got to be able to make it quick enough that we can actually use it. And what we found is that somewhat bizarrely, maybe we're actually doing even better um, than when we were when we were doing this massive amounts of computation. And there's two reasons that this sort of happens. Um, the first is that we're sort of actually avoiding running Bayesian inference while we're doing it. So uh, because we're sort of doing everything end to end, uh, we've got this sort of deep learning idea going on that basically, rather than sort of splitting the bounds in stages and doing everything in turn, if you can make everything end to end, that often does better. And here, 
it turns out that basically learning a network that goes from past designs to the next design is often an easier thing to learn than the posterior itself. So actually learning the posterior density can be a more difficult task, but if we make the whole thing end to end, cut out the middleman, there will be sort of an implicit representation of the posterior going on inside the, the deep learning architecture, um, but it doesn't have to be exact and it can learn to do it in a way that's most accurate to its final task. And we avoid this, this inference and that actually turns out that it gives us big boosts uh, in performance. Um, the second reason it can help is, is, is even more interesting, um, which is that it actually allows us to learn sort of truly superior policies than you might ever learn um, using uh, the sort of traditional uh, Bayesian adaptive design approach, um, because the traditional approach is actually um, sort of myopic or greedy. And uh, to sort of explain what I mean by this, just imagine we're trying to split this sort of line into equal segments. In the traditional approach, what we would do is we'd first choose the best split based on um, the fact we're only doing one split. We want to sort of get the, the sort of most even splits. And so we're gonna choose first to put something in the middle, um, but that's actually suboptimal when we make another uh, experiment iteration. So what the just traditional approach of just looking at the EIG for one step ahead doesn't take into account that some designs give us better future learning potential than others. And therefore, here we see that if we split in the middle, we massively reduced our learning potential uh, and therefore got a very poor second split. Um, but if we learn um, to sort of project ahead and we think about this whole thing as, uh, as an end-to-end -end problem, we'll put our first split sort of a third of the way along and our second split another third of the way along uh, and get this optimal splitting. So what we see is that basically when we do these deep adaptive design approaches, because we're considering the whole adaptive uh, process as one segment, we're optimizing the whole thing in one end-to-end -end sweep, we can actually learn these non-myopic approaches that learn um, that while certain designs taken now will give us better sort of um, rewards sort of in the future, uh, whereas just sort of greedily choosing the best thing now isn't always best. Um, and this is very interestingly sort of linked to sort of reinforcement learning. So um, some of this work with policies is, is dragging this basic experimental design approaches more and more towards kind of model-based uh, reinforcement learning and there it's very well known that if you just be greedy you get very um, poor approaches but you can do much better by projecting forwards and, and sort of this exploration and exploitation and what we're seeing is that we're actually sort of managing uh, to exploit that here by learning this, this sort of full um, policy-based approach. Um, so what does this then look like? So here we've got a, a problem that's sort of a location finding problem and uh, so we've got sort of two sources um, and we're trying to sort of find the sources and each time we do an observation um, we get sort of a, a, a some feedback of like how close we are to the sources uh, and what this is showing is that basically um, the dad sort of policy once it's trained on this problem can learn to do this do this kind of thing automatically and uh, we see this sort of spiraling behavior uh, where it could go and search um, for these kind of sources uh, and as we see here, as soon as it sees uh, that region there, it will take a lot more uh, iterations uh, nearby. And the, the key is that we can then go and deploy this uh, for a real search problem or potentially multiple search problems. So if we say had a real sort of sensing problem, maybe there's some sort of containment link and we have some sense problem. If we've learned this, we can go and very quickly deploy it. Each iteration of this can happen uh, near instantaneously and uh, it can go uh, and be effective. And again, we find that this, for these sort of location finding problems, uh, we again get these big uh, improvements, not only in speed, where this time it's about a million times um, faster than the traditional approach, uh, but again, we're, we're seeing these, these quite noticeable improvements uh, in performance in terms of information gain. And it's, it's worth pointing out here that information lives on a logarithmic scale. So going at kind of two, uh, sort of bits and information here is it, well, not too big, but sort of it's um, going up two here is, is quite significant. It's because it's sort of almost logarithmically varying and um, that has actually represents a very significantly improved uh, design. And again, just to reiterate, the reason it's able to get these gains is that it's not needing to do the posterior approximation. Um, and so therefore it's not limited by sort of how good I say variational approximation of the posterior could be. And it's allowing these non-myopic properties. Um, so it's, it's taking into account um, that as I go forward, I need to um, 
project forward and, and realize that my effects now can have knock-on effects in the future. Um, another aspect uh, and a sort of a follow-up paper that we we're about to um, publish at NeurIPS uh, in a couple of weeks um, is to go and actually uh, address one of the, the big limitations of this approach, which was that um, so far I've, I've assumed access to a likelihood function. I've assumed that I've got the density uh, of outcomes um, given model parameters and designs. Uh, but a lot of the time we don't have that. A lot of the time our models are implicit. Uh, we often have kind of simulators. Those simulators may be stochastic and they're going to take in some inputs and they're going to return um, some outputs. And a lot of the time uh, that we want to go and use these kind of adaptive uh, Bayesian experimental design approaches is in these implicit settings uh, because a lot of the time we have good models is where people have spent a lot of time doing very carefully um, constructed simulators. And those simulators uh, are much easier often to design than sort of uh, closed form uh, likelihoods. And uh, we can't immediately go and do the, the approach as I've explained so far, um, because for example, this sort of likelihood PHT and theta um, pi is not um, evaluatable for these sort of um, simulator to base models. So uh, recently we had, uh, as I said, IDAD, uh, which is implicit DAD, um, which basically shows that we can also do these sort of policy-based style approaches without actually requiring densities, but just uh, requiring um, samples from the models. Uh, and the way this is done is basically constructing variational bounds uh, that only uh, require samples. Uh, they don't actually require um, a sort of explicit density model uh, that we're working with. Uh, the, the, the key uh, to those is to uh, introduce what's known as a critic network. So these are um, appearing, these appear in quite a few things. They sort of appear in uh, ABC methods, they appear in GAMs, they're kind of the, the critic network in a GAM. And what they do is, is um, they take in a history uh, and a feature and they essentially try and uh, approximate the ratio of the likelihood over um, the marginal likelihood. So they, they're kind of like almost like a sort of amortized inference thing again, but this time they're kind of looking at the ratio of the likelihood um, to the marginal likelihood. And what we can do is, is we can then actually construct uh, training objectives that are still lower bounds on the total information we gain, uh, the functions of uh, our policy and this critic network, but which don't require anything other than samples from the model. They can be pure uh, sample-based um, bounds. And if we optimize these things, we, we simultaneously learn the policy from the critic. Uh, and then we can go and use uh, the policy uh, once we've learned it. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to, to run a bit towards the end on time, so I won't go through this in, in too much detail, uh, but the, the, the bounds you get for this um, can take various forms. Um, you can have the so-called sort of NWJ bounds. Uh, these are based on kind of the, the relationship that X log X is always less than X, and you can use that to derive um, lower bounds on the mutual information. And what you get is you get these sort of terms that are sort of expectations of uh, the critic network. Um, and because uh, the only part our model comes in is in that expectation, uh, we can go and optimize these um, just using sample based things. So if you see here, the only place the model comes in is, is in these two expectations. Uh, you can also do things like the uh, influence E bound. Uh, so this is quite a, a common bound in deep learning circles um, on mutual information. Uh, it's using sort of contrastive learning and things there. And again, uh, there's another mechanism uh, where you can form bounds that are true lower bounds on uh, the total information gain, uh, where we only have the model appear uh, in our expectations, and it's the critic that appears inside the expectation. Uh, and so again, we can train this thing uh, with sort of stochastic um, gradient ascent schemes. And what this leads to is the same sort of idea um, as DAD. We get these policy-based approaches uh, without likelihoods. And uh, we do this offline training uh, using this implicit model, the simulator plus a prior. We can train both the design network and the critic network. And then we just use that design network uh, during the live experiment. And if we want to say do Bayesian inference right at the end, we can also actually use uh, that critic network. Uh, it can also be quite a useful thing um, downstream uh, for things like uh, Bayesian inference, uh, even though it's not necessarily uh, directly needed. Uh, that means then we can go and apply this to a lot of sort of real world 
uh, models. Um, so we, uh, in the paper, go and apply this um, to this sort of classic SRI model that looks at sort of um, epidemiology. So you can go and uh, model COVID. A lot of the COVID models are done on this uh, based on uh, sort of uh, R numbers, basically. So if you have different R numbers, you have uh, different sort of uh, relationships between time and, and how you have a number of infected individuals. And if you want to say, go and do your, uh, if you're a government, you want to decide about when you're going to do testing, when you're going to sort of expand your budget and how um, you can use uh, these kind of models that are often uh, implicit models and you can learn policies um, to learn government policies, I suppose, uh, in terms of things like when you're going to sort of prioritize testing, when you're going to prioritize uh, other things. Uh, and again, the sort of the key take home is that these approaches work very well. Uh, and they tend to outperform uh, these traditional approaches, uh, even without access to the likelihood. Um, if uh, people are interested in going, uh, having a play with some of these things, um, uh, Adam and Desi did um, a lot of work sort of doing some of the implementations. It's a lot of it's implemented in the probabilistic programming system, Pyro, uh, which can make it very easy to go and uh, use this. It's a lot of things are automated. Uh, and so it should be quite an easy package uh, to go uh, and use it if you want to try and deploy it. Uh, so just to wrap things up, uh, I've been talking about this, this deep adaptive design approach. I've been talking about how instead of learning uh, designs directly, we want to try thinking about learning policies. And by learning policies, um, we can go and do adaptive design in real time uh, because we can go and make our decisions uh, very quickly. And the key to that uh, has been these, these variational objectives uh, and this end-to-end -end sort of style training uh, that allows us to train uh, these networks and then uh, our ability to sort of uh, go and deploy them. And the other thing that's been important, I think they've talked about, is that actually it turns out that this often gives us performance gains uh, rather than performance drops uh, compared to sort of non amortized approaches uh, because of allowing for non-myopicness and uh, the end-to-endness, not meaning that we have to do uh, inference at each step. Uh, so with that, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd also like to um, thank uh, my co-authors, so in particular uh, my ex-PhD student Adam Foster, who led uh, a lot of this work, and my current um, PhD student Desi, uh, but also Ilias and Stephen and uh, Michael as well. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully there's some time for a few questions.